All right, we are talking about a series called Radically Receiving, Radical Receiving. We can't receive what we don't believe. Um, and this is the, uh, every season is hard to believe. By the way, I've seen a bunch of people I know from the past. Some of you are visiting, some of you are here. I'm just glad you're still alive. Hallelujah. Uh, we're still here together. We're going to live forever. Let's live forever. Let's live forever. Who wants to live forever? Who wants to live forever? It's good. It's better. It's better. It's better. And so I, I believe that believing, even when it's difficult, you know, there's three trains on the, as a young Christian I saw on a train track. One is the word, one is faith, one is feelings. And a lot of people are led by feelings. Their caboose is leading their life. Led by feeling, I don't feel like it, I don't wanna, you know. Maybe when some of the QR codes were being posted, you know, signing up for this, signing up for that, I don't know. I don't know if I'm feeling it right now. You know, I, I'm a choreographer, Susie would know that. I'm I, I, not a choreographer, but I wanted to sign up at that point. I wanted, yeah, I'll help them out, but I have no skills. But in life, we are always being confronted with, right now, especially in this age, where COVID kind of sucked that part of us that is willing to just jump in. And we got you know, homebound, couchbound, and we just started uh, to get sedimentary, you know. Uh, we put ourselves out to pasture. Uh, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants to break that off. I'm signing up for new things. I'm saying yes to the future. I'm saying yes. I'm just, listen, I'm just getting started. Are you kidding, Sean? I'm going to hike, go for hike. Okay, so I'm believing for 25, I'm, I'm going to be 100 years old. I was thinking today, we started in 97. Uh, I was 48 years old. At the 50th anniversary, I'll be 98 years old. <laughs> so what? Seriously, I, I, I believe we've got to get a vision for the future because the world doesn't have it. And, and if you're just going to run on the fumes of the past and if it was only easier and it's so hard and I don't know if I want to, we're going to have to believe for some brand new things. I love what you shared. That was a beautiful thing because we have to look at who we are where we've come from, and that God came to rescue us, and I'm still in need of a Savior. It wasn't a little phase I went through. I needed a Savior, but now I'm good. No, I need a Savior every day. I need Jesus to save my life. So Mother Teresa obviously had a, she had a house for the dying in Calcutta. One day a man visited her there, spent three months there, and got to finally meet her. And uh, he said, you know, uh, how can I pray, f how, could you pray for me? And she said, how can I, what would you like me to pray for? He said, pray that I'll have clarity. She said, no, I will not pray that for you. She goes, why not? Well, I, she says, I, I, I cannot pray that for you. She said, uh, and there should be a slide for that up there, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. Now think about that right now for your life. I'm just trying to get clear. I just want to know exactly what I should be doing. I want to know what the next step is. I want to get some understanding. She said, it's, it's what you're clinging to and you've got to let go of. And this guy was kind of stunned. And so he said to her, but you always seem like you have clarity. She laughed and she said, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I will pray that you will trust God. Now I would say she did a few things. I think she stepped out a little. I think she transformed a few million people in her life, maybe hundreds of millions, were inspired like I was by this lady's life. But she says she didn't clearly know what to do, but she put one foot in front of another. And I have found, especially getting older, where, uh, you know, as you get older, if you're still wanting to be fully awake and impassioned for God, th then the opportunities will change. And then you have to decide... Uh, Am I still willing to step up and step in? Uh, and I, even this last season, we've been, I was been sick about the last month, and I'm really very healthy and not normally sick, but just battling something. Uh, and I finally realized, because the things I'm working on, to me, are all impossible. I haven't worked on something that's not impossible for many years. So they're all impossible. They require a ridiculous amount of faith. They're Hail Mary passes. It's going to take God moving. But God says, get in there, and I want you to believe me. So I'd be crawling out of bed. I'm getting up, you know, this morning I got up, I don't know, 
four in the morning. I'm getting up at crazy times, continuing to obey. I'm speaking to my soul. We're gonna keep going forward. And I appeal that to each of you. Uh, don't, don't say it's, you're done. And don't wait for the clarity. Uh, I don't even break. I'm not even breaking when I see the understanding exit. Because the Bible says he's gonna give you peace beyond your understanding. So that exit, that's great. I may understand, I may not understand. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going for the peace beyond understanding, and that's required by obedience. I'm just obeying. Now I find, as I obey, little by little, the snail made it to the ark. Little by little, I am crawling forward, moment by moment, the best I know. And, and it isn't like, you know, when you're really a mature Christian, you know exactly what's going on, you know exactly what to do, and that's baloney. I'm as dependent on God as ever. And when I looked in the Bible to, to find the old dudes in the Bible and see how they did, I wasn't always encouraged. I mean, you got Jehoshaphat and Josiah dying in battles they shouldn't have uh, been in. You know, you have Uzziah, you know, reaching his arm up to get the priests out and his gets leprosy, you got Hezekiah being miraculously healed, and then he turns into an idiot. I mean, what is going on? So I didn't find comfort. Solomon, I, I was ready to punch him out a few years ago. If I saw him again, I said, no, I, give, I am, I'm gonna tell you, because uh, this guy, the smartest dude ever, God appeared to him twice, and he's worshiping demons the end of his life. So guys, I'm, we're gonna need God while there's breath in us. There's no cruise control, there's no autopilot, there's no like I got this now. Yes, I'm expecting life to get more challenging. What were you expecting? <laughs> now I, I love this, this analogy. If, if a father said to a young son, I love these kids up here, I love them just marinating here in the presence of God, and gradually the, you know, the worship will begin to seep into them, and then one day they'll begin to worship God. It'll be happening, it's an organic thing. Our daughters were the same way, okay? Uh, so yet they grow into it as you nurture that and affirm that. But I love using the analogy that if a, 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 a father said to a six-year-old child, I want you to, you know, uh, come over here because I want to hit you as hard as I can. Would that child expect the father to hit them as hard as they could? If, if a kid said, Dad, I want you to really hit me hard, would the dad knock him out? Well, if I say, God, make my life hard. Come on, God, make it hard. Is God going to change anything? Any more than if I said, God, please make it easy. <laughs> it's just hard. Yeah. Nothing changes. He's not listening to you. Have you noticed God does not ask you what you think? Have you ever noticed that God does? You know what? What do you think? <laughs> he knows what we think. That takes incredible patience on his part to not just, you know, when I was thinking some really bad things and doing some really bad things, he could have gone, you're done, thank you. He was gracious, he's kind, he's long-suffering, he's patient. Quality, we love love, joy, peace, but long-suffering, patience, faithfulness, those things are in there. They're just like the other three, and they, they, we need them now. We need that quality. So, when, when I, you know, driving w with my parents growing up in a car, um, you know, I would say sometimes, you know, how long before we get there? But I would never say, do you know where you're going? Do you have any idea where this car is going right now? I never questioned them. I never banged on the cockpit of a plane asking a stranger if he knew what he was doing. I've been trusting pilots for millions of miles. Unknown quantities. They may have gotten drunk as far as I know. The God of the universe has done enough in every one of our lives that we can trust him. I don't want to stand, I know this is not going to happen, I don't want to stand before God and he goes, what the heck were you so concerned about? I did everything. I blessed your life over and over again and you were freaking out. Francis, buddy. So I say that to myself now, I say, Francis, I don't need God to do more in my life. I'm embarrassed at times by my responses. So. I've got to really grow up in it. 
Uh, and so I want to have ferocious faith in the future. I want to be an aggressive guy. Yeah, I'm going to be crazy in the future. Crazy believe in God. I'm not here to impress anybody. That's one of the great things about getting old. You really don't care. <laughs> I love you, but I could give a rip about what you think. I'm gonna stand before God. You wanna get my concern? I'm gonna stand before the God of the universe who has done enormous things in my life. I care what he thinks. And he has been so good to me that I wanna live fully awake, fully conscious of who he is and what he has done. Many assumptions, here's a slide, many of my assumptions about life have been really presumption. Trust is believing God has all the clarity I need. I don't need to know what's going on. I know he knows. People would say, I just want things to get better. What does that mean? Like a cross, like a fiery furnace? What does look better? Well, it's when I play God and I determine what should happen. Well, that's not gonna be better. You playing God is gonna be really bad. Because the God of the universe already has written a perfect script for you. Out of all possible options, God made you as an individual. There's no one like you. And he's written a unique script that no one else has. You're all tired for first place, for the best script ever written. And it's your life. Ever, we have identical twin daughters. I am a twin. Comparison has always been something. My whole life I've been comparing, comparing, comparing. And I knew with the girls that, you know, and I would, early on I would say, you're my favorite, don't tell your sister. Okay, so, and after a while they picked up on what I was doing, but we are tied, our script is perfect. Every moment you've been jealous of someone or felt like you were cheated, my childhood made me the person I am. What I went through, don't take it away, grow from it, learn from it. It produced the passions in my heart. If you go to my office, <laughs> my office has blankets of pictures of all my family. I've got, I, I, I have another blanket, honey, it's coming shortly. I know. <laughs> there was a little spot, there was a little spot that needs a blankie. And I found pictures of my family because I grew up in a boarding school. I didn't have my own room at home. And so I didn't have stuff around my, I had a little guest room, I'd come and stay in periodically. Nothing there of my own, I suitcase, pack your bag, go back, that's where I lived. So that was my childhood. So I love seeing my family. That makes me emotional to say it, and you sound weird, I could care less. It's exactly what I love, I love my family. And I'm getting a blankie. <laughs> I'm not allowing, I'm not wallowing in ignorance. I'm resting in confidence. You know, the fact that I don't know what's going on does not make me dumb. It could make me humble if I'm trusting someone else does. And he's the God of the universe and he's doing pretty good without me. Trusting God in guiding my life. At times, he lets me know where I'm going. Most of the time, I need to trust. Jesus knows. Honestly, even the challenges I'm facing, if you want to bore me, try and get me to focus on my challenges. <sighs> I really don't care. I'm sorry, I'm not really. Because <sighs> I'm training my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions to not be a little brat, to not be fixated on what's not happening. To not say why to God, but saying what to God. What are you trying to show me right now? What are you doing in my life that makes this moment worth it? What character are you producing in me to make me a better person? Do I want my life easier? That's silliness. No parent looks at their child and say, I'm gonna do my best to make your life as easy as possible because I want you to be a spoiled brat. <laughs> no parent does that. Now again, you're not being harsh, but you're training them to have a backbone, to have muscle, to stand up, to have conviction, to know what is right and do it, whether they feel like it or not. We can't receive what we don't believe. We can't receive what we don't believe. Do you ever notice how as soon as people saw Jesus, he disappeared? They suddenly see what God is doing, 
it's over. He'll give you a glimpse, like he'll open a door. See, watch, whoop, gone. In the book of Luke, the resurrected Jesus appeared to a few of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. They had a long conversation. They didn't know who he was, but as soon as they recognized who he was, he disappears. The book of Luke, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappears. Why? Because he wants them to work out. He wants to build faith. You've seen me. I've been helping Sean recently work out. He looks a little puffy, and I've been helping him out. <laughs> Terrible. So sad. We're saying, no, stay. Jesus goes, I can't. If I stay, I'm going to make you weak. If I spoon feed you like a little boy, you're going to be a weak man. I'm making you strong. So I'll give you a little, I'll show you what's next, that's it, then I'm gone, I'm out. You're gonna walk by faith, you're gonna walk by faith. Only faith pleases God. We get a brief glimpse of a heavenly clarity, a revelation from God's heart, but in order to walk in it, we must learn to access it by faith in God's word and promises. If you were to say to a doctor, doc, you know, I've decided, I'm not gonna eat anymore, I don't need it, I don't really wanna eat, it's, you know, food's not that essential. And so he's gonna, he's gonna say, you know what, you're gonna die. No, no, you don't understand, I, I worked it through, I've had enough food, it's great, I don't need any more, you will die. If you stick with that, you will die. So when the Bible talks about the word of God being more necessary than our most important food, Job said, I desire your word more than my necessary food. I will just tell you, you have no shot of following Jesus without you getting an addiction for the word of God. Amen. I'm sorry, zero chance. Any more than you could survive without food. That's not being hard, Francis. Why are you say I have to eat food to live? Well, uh... It's a law, and that's a spiritual law. So I am grateful. I used to, you know, felt a little bad. I was traveling as an evangelist for 20 years before I pastored, and so I'd be on planes with the 90 decibels inside the, the plane area, and I'd have these lousy, you know, uh, cassette players, you know, with these little hearing devices that were lousy, and I'd put them up as long as I, how loud as I could for as long as I could, and that really helped me. So I have hearing aids now, and so initially I thought, well, what a bummer, I have hearing aids. But then I realized I have the Word of God. I can put the Word of God everywhere. I'm walking in stores, and the Word's on. I'm going, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Great. I'm driving. I'm taking a, I, I am washing with the washing of the water of the Word. I'm going to the Bible a third time. I'm on my third time for the year, just washing, Washing, swimming, enjoying, embellishing. I, I do love the fact that the rock is a place that either we're going to talk about what's real or we're just going to lie to you and tell you sweet nothings that will not help you. We'll just give you donuts and pancakes and say you'll be great. Just use more syrup. So I, I had this little imaginary thing. Um, I'm whining about my troubling season, and I quip to God, God, what do, you want, what do you want from me? And God says, only what's best, Francis. Not clear what that could mean and nervous about the possibilities, possibilities I sheepishly said, and what would that be? Hoping his response would bring clarity I needed uh, the clarity I needed, his inner voice was immediate. Out of all possibilities, Francis, for your life, it's the perfect future you'd hope for if you knew what you really needed. I love the thought of a perfect future, and so I added, well, well, how would I know what that is? As if he was about to reveal to me the secret of my life, I leaned in with anticipation. One word floated through my mind, trust. I was stuck. The only way I could see and experience peace was to receive the gift he promised, and that was to trust God. God has nothing for you of eternal value except accessed by faith. Right. 
And so every situation, we're going to talk about what, how we become unfaithed. I invented that word, if you want to quote me. <laughs> I also invented something recently, you can quote me, a picture's worth a thousand words. You can quote me on that one too. <laughs> Unfaithing our lives, there's five deceptions that keep us from trusting God. Number one, we stop renewing our faith and fall into unbelief. We stop renewing, we stop eating the word, we stop believing the word, we stop standing on the word, we stop stepping out. Every day I'm looking for opportunities to step out, no matter how I feel. Our next door neighbor has had cancer. And uh, again, I've been, I've been out for a while. And uh, we prayed with them before, loved them, but just saw the garage door open and she just had a mastectomy, been through a bunch of stuff. And so I just walked over and you know, I went for the first day, I went to the gym and swam yesterday. First day in a month, I'm out, I'm gonna kick, spit, get my body going again. Thank you so much. And so uh, they came out from the garage and she was a little sheepish, but just loving on them and praying for them, encouraging her about her health and what God was doing. It's like, and, and again, the point was, my initial thought was, hey, I'm just recovering. I'm just coming back from the gym. I got a bathing suit on, you know. Um, do I, get out of your car and talk to them. That's your future. Your future, either if you, if you want a future, it's gonna be accessed by faith. And there's no other eternal future, there's no other lasting future. So Moses presumed that by striking the rock in anger at Meribah, instead of speaking to it, he would bring forth water as before. So instead of walking by faith, he walked in anger and frustration, and sadly, he didn't go into the land. Here he'd been all these years, you know, he's 80 years old when he pulls them out of Egypt. And now he's 120. This, this man has been a faithful man. I don't understand it. I'm not here to critique God about it. But there was a moment in time where he knew better. There's a movie, Angelina Jolie. Is it Silk? Is it, what's it called? Salt, thank you. Salt, final scene on the plane. Uh, the cop that she could have killed at one point. He's saying that I captured you and she goes, I could have killed you. I could have taken you out. And then she says these words that were just like a prophetic sentence. You know better. You know better. And I'm thinking, oh. all of a sudden that word begins to go into me. I know better. I know better. Anyway, Angelina and I are very close. <laughs> Every gift God has for us is received by faith. That's it, nothing else. There's no gift coming except by faith. He's the perfect father. The currency of heaven is faith. You ever see these nations that go into bankruptcy or they're captured and they have piles of bags of money and they're just throwing the money around? It's like, no, it's nothing. It's worth nothing. Whining, nothing. Complaining, nothing. Self-pity, nothing. Self-pity does not move mountains. God has never responded once when I've whined. He says, I've got new wine. I'm not gonna respond to your little temper tantrum, Francis. Hebrews 11, now faith, present tense faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now that can sound like, you know, a shell game. You know what, you're not gonna get it now, but you're gonna get it later. Don't worry about it, you're not gonna see it, you're not gonna feel it, but it's gonna come. Like a barker, what's going on here? Now, if we had not seen that the Lord is good, if we've not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if we have not been spared, I should be dead decades ago. I remember in the world, I went to a palm reader and they said, you'll be dead by 24. Thank you so much, that's so kind. <laughs> and I was on that trajectory. I was attempting suicide at 23. Number two, we are filled with pride. He's an unfaithing quality. We're filled with pride about a supernatural victory. You know, you're thinking, what I need is more victory. Mm. That's, that's dangerous. More people have fallen in victory. 
after victory than in failure. Failure is one of my closest friends. We, just, we go everywhere together. But I don't care what he thinks. And I chalk, I'm, I'm overstating something by calling it a failure. Because if I respond well to a great difficulty, irrespective of the outcome, I have one responsibility. There's one seat I sit on. It's the obedience seat. That's my seat, obedience. If I move over to the outcome seat, there's a sign that says, this is made for one rear end and it's not yours. <laughs> obedience is my rear end. Outcome is God's rear end. And so when I suddenly think I know what should happen, you're playing God. How many of you found playing God has worked out for you? There's, how many think that, you know what, if I was in charge, remember the movie Bruce Almighty, which is kind of a fun movie, you know, all of a sudden he can just, yes, 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 every prayer, yes, you want that, no problem, let's do it. And it turned into total chaos. We'd be lousy gods. Elijah had an amazing triumph. He calls down fire. He says, there's not enough water on the altar. Pour more water on. It's a miracle. He thinks it's gonna happen. There's gonna be a revival. The prophets of Baal are then killed. It looks like, man, everything's going awesome. Then he hears Jezebel wants to kill him. He goes and hides in a cave. Little Jezebel, too much makeup lady. You know, she's hiding in a cave from little Jezebel. And God comes to him very graciously. And I, Elijah's going, oh, I've forsaken you, I'm only I have left. And God goes, there's 7,000 that have not bowed their knee. I, I know, then he tries, sends wind, and he sends earth, he sends, shakes things so that slap him around. Elijah, wake up, buddy. And he says, you know, uh, what do you think? He goes, there's still, I'm the only one. And God goes, okay, left-hander, Elijah, come in. Elijah, give me the ball. You're done, thank you so much. That was it. Had an incredible victory. And he was done. Because he somehow got overconfident in what he thought should happen. He was filled with pride. Again, I, I don't really care that much. I, you know, if I were to say, if you were to say in heaven, when they... When we see the back side of this life and we see what were the victories and what were the failures, we might be surprised that a lot of the things we called victories were not victories eternally. And the things we called failures but responded well to, they were the high points of our life. Was the cross a failure? I mean, that was a very low point. The God of the universe became sin for us. Philippians 4, do not be anxious for anything. That, that includes a lot of things. That includes any imaginable situation you're in. I sh there's never thing that merits anxiety. I, I believe the videotape replay of Paul having his head chopped off, rolling across the floor, he's smiling. There's a little rolly head smiling <laughs> as he rolls across the floor. I know that's something you never thought of before, but... Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, in prayer, now again, it goes right back to trust, prayer and supplication, pr with thanksgiving. Thank God, I don't care what happens. I don't need to know what needs to happen. I just want to trust you. I want to flow. You're Fred Astaire. I'm Ginger Rogers. We're just going to dance, Lord. It's going to be awesome. I'm just flowing. That's all I'm doing. Now, if you again, if you're trusting him, my wife doesn't trust me that much in driving anymore. So she drives us. <laughs> I'm not gonna critique it because I was praying for a chauffeur and now I have one. <laughs> With thanksgiving, let your request, and she's a very good driver and we're safe. And what's gonna happen? As you pray without anxiety, thankful, trusting, God's gonna give you peace way past that distant understanding exit, peace beyond your understanding. And then all of a sudden, that trust will put a guard, a hedge around your heart and mind. That's what I'm building right now. I am building a, a hedge around my heart and mind to trust God. I don't care what's happening. I don't care how it turns out. 
That's not overstated. That's from living a long life. I'm glad, thank you, Sean, for not euthanizing old people, because we're still here <laughs> for a good reason. You might learn something about what not to do and what to do. Number three, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go faster because I'm so enjoying myself being here with you. <laughs> Number three, we, we are overly enamored by our good response. So all of a sudden, <laughs> you saw a victory and you weren't seduced by it, or you had a failure and you weren't stumbled by it, and then you're like, you're like and God goes, you're an idiot. You were doing so good, and then you thought it was great. You know, Job was thinking that he, his righteous life would protect him from suffering, you know, and, and yet when he faced severe trials, I mean, big trials, family wiped out, everything he owned, God, boils in his body, a wife who said, curse God and die, that's not a helpmate. Okay, so all those things, he suffered great things, and yet he said, though he slay me, I will trust him. He came to that place of absolute indifference. I don't, whatever. Slay me. Once again, if I said to God, kill me, or whatever, God's not gonna follow my lead. His script is perfect. He just needs me to just say, okay, Lord, I calm my soul. I have no preference. I don't know enough to have a preference. I don't know enough to have a bias. I don't know what should happen. I'm not God. And what I do for me, I'll give you a little backstage pass secret. I look at all worst case scenarios. My wife doesn't, you know. When I, when I had the revelation that God liked me, 30 years in the Lord as a Christian, I realized that God liked me. Susie goes, well, of course God likes you. My dad liked me, why wouldn't God like me? Well that's because she had a warm, fuzzy upbringing. But if, if you don't know that thought, then that's a brand new thought. God actually likes me. He doesn't just love me generically because he has to put up with me, but he likes me. He made me to be a fascination to him. He doesn't like everything I do just like I don't like everything I do, but he likes the essence of me. So with, with each of us in our lives, I forget the point. That's okay. <laughs> Proverbs. <laughs> Wasn't that good though? I was just really working it. Almost done, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean. Once again, don't, 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 don't. I know the Bible says, you know, with all your getting wisdom, get understanding. I know that's okay in the early innings. If you can understand a little bit with the wisdom, that's good. But it doesn't mean you should be waiting for the wisdom to do something. Wait for the understanding to do something. Much of what I do, I, I don't, I'm not even sure it's gonna work. It's impossible. God says, do it. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Number four, my, we question what we know is true about God. This is really difficult because, once again, individuals in the Bible that know, these guys know, there's no greater man born a woman than John the Baptist, and yet when he's in prison, he sent guys to the, Jesus and saying, are you the one, or should we look for another? And he knew him in the womb. When, when Elizabeth was having John, John leapt in the womb when Mary came in with Jesus in her womb. He knew Jesus from the womb. He baptized, this is the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew who he was, but all of a sudden, the body slams of life. He's struggling, and he's about to be beheaded. Now, who knows what they did to him? Are you the one, or should we look for another? And then Jesus says these words, Blessed is he, happy and to be envy is he who is not offended in the things I put him through. So what I'm saying is offensive things are coming. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's <laughs> so sweet. Yes, offensive things are coming. What were you expecting? You're getting, you're being prepared for harder things. If you go to boot camp, which I've not been, they're not preparing you, you know what, well, it's gonna be a little tough now, but at the very end it's gonna be easy because you're not really gonna go to war. You're, no, you're going to war. You're gonna be fighting for your life. I'm fighting for my life. I'm not a, it's not a heaven and hell thing, but it's a sane or insane. It's stupid or discerning what life's about. A lot of people don't finish. Well, like my father died with prostitutes in the room. 
lot of people don't finish well. I want to finish well. I want you to finish well. I want you who are asleep to wake up. You have given up to get back in the game, to say, I'm believing today. And again, Jesus said of John, there's no one greater than John the Baptist, born of woman. Final unfaithing, our playing God never ends well. Do you want less disappointment in your life? Stop playing God. <laughs> Stop grabbing the wheel. Stopping, stop thinking you know what should happen. Stop giving into a disappointment because you've not waited for the right appointment. You just put your emotions around at a point in time you thought should happen and it didn't happen because it wasn't God's intent. I hope, I, you guys are like, I had a good time. I just want to say that right now. I had a good time. I felt good about this. The disciples, you know, Jesus. Come on, man. He's got a roll. People love Palm Sunday. They're waving palms. Come on. We're students going to do this. They're expecting him to take over the Roman government. the new king. And then he dies. And he told them over and over again. He told them what they didn't want to hear. I don't know what that is. Is on my back doing that? <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what it is. I tightened the deal. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> See that? I had a little bit of unbelief at that point, but I'm okay now. <laughs> I should have known that. I did know that. Thank you, Sean. Let's get Pastor Sean a hand right now. He solved the problem right there. He solved it. So they're devastated. I don't need crucifixion thinking. I need resurrection thinking. If you don't have resurrection thinking when you're being crucified, you're in trouble. Final. I know you want me to talk all day. I just can't. And don't tell me who won the 49er game if you're looking at your phone. Do not tell me. <laughs> Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. You're wondering, I wonder, if you're ever wondering, is God thinking what I'm thinking? Mm, no. <laughs> right, right now, I mean, no. How about that? Mm, no. Now, if you want to reiterate his word, that's good. Say something consistent with what you know he's thinking. Don't you know, make it a Russian roulette where you're applying it to this moment and it's going to happen now because I believe this. No, don't do that. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as he the heavens are higher above the earth, so are my ways higher above your and my thoughts than your thoughts. Today, I want us to pray. And I want to pray for you. Listen, I do not believe, I don't care what your poker face is saying, I do not believe that I've missed saying the word that applies to you. It applies to every one of us. There's red dots all over. Don't get your chest. There's red dots all over your chest right now. Every one of us in this room battle with unbelief, doubt, double-mindedness, half-heartedness. We've given up too soon. We've all given up too soon. We've all given up too soon. And especially in this age, when it's going to get harder and it's going to be more challenging, those are not fatalistic words. Those are words that say, suck it up. When, when COVID hit, God spoke to my heart. It's in the book of Hezekiah. You can look it up. Hezekiah. Not in the Bible. Okay. Uh, he said, suck it up, buttercup. That's what he said to me at one point. Suck it up, buttercup. To toughen me up. Let me say this. I'm more of a cup is half empty person. Susie's more of a cup is half full person. And that's great. And so if you're going, man, Francis, you're like militant. Well, yeah, I need that. For my mind, for my heart, for my past, for my journey, I need that. If you can do that in a, more, in a less militant way, great. I'm not trying to force feed you. I'm just saying, I want you to be successful in following God all the days of your life and not picked off because you embraced a appointment that was not yours and it dissed you. 
Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. Lord, I thank you for each one of us that are fearfully and wonderfully made. Every one of us who have a script that at our best of all possible options, you wrote a script for us that is the best finale, has the most wonderful finale in eternity. If we can see it, we don't need anything else someone else has because what we have in front of us, what we, what we have written in our script is perfectly tailored for our temperament, our personality, our past, our history, everything, our talents. It's all perfect for who we're called to be. And if we would embrace that, we'll end our days trusting, resting, flowing. I don't understand that Mother Teresa battled depression her whole life. She had a priest that she wrote to. But did she carry that? Would you ever have looked at that amazing lady and going, there's a, there's a depressed lady right there? No. She swatted those mosquitoes and trusted God. So Lord, we trust you today, Lord. I pray for everyone in this room, for this beautiful church family, Lord, for the future you have for us that is bright. You are the God of happy endings. You're the God who is limited. In Psalm 72, you say, you only do wondrous things. You only do wondrous things. So we embrace today the wondrous things you have for us. I want you to pray out loud with me, if you wouldn't mind. Pray with, something about speaking the word. One thing to hear about it. But God spoke the world into existence. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so if you agree with this, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in agreement. And would you pray from your heart right now fervently in Jesus' name. Would you pray out loud? Heavenly Father, your word is truth. You sent your word to heal us. You sent your spirit to free us. I don't want to play God. I want to let you be God. I thank you, Jesus, for taking the punishment for my sins and giving me a clean slate, making me as white as snow, as pure as a little baby. I want to follow you now completely trusting everything that is before me. This I know, God is for me. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room, Lord. I pray that they would trust in you, Jesus. If they have not let you be the Lord of their life, today, let, become the Lord of, let, let, let Jesus become the Lord of your life. You're the only one, Lord, who knows the future, who knows how to solve the riddle of our life, who can make sense of it. So we humble ourselves, surrender ourselves to you fully, become the Lord of our life today in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Just pray in your heart, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to live for you from this day forward. I want to trust you. This, unwa this waveringness will stop. This weakness of, of not trusting you will stop. I'm going to believe your promises that are, and I'm going to say yes and amen to them all the days of my life in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Give God a hand. Amen.